My name is Faye. Welcome to our portfolio stream. Uh, I am super excited to be sharing my top tips, uh, the do's and don'ts, mostly the don'ts uh, for today. So thank you so much for joining me tonight. Uh, behind the scenes is a lovely Daria. So Daria will be our mod. So if you have any questions at all, feel free to drop them in the chat. So I'd like to uh, introduce Wing Canvas, what we do. So Wing Canvas is an online art school. We started off as a brick and mortar studio. And uh, just this year, we <laughs> went online. And so this is our amazing team that is behind the scenes. And I am sure that you probably have seen uh, Jesse before. You've probably seen Jay and Alina uh, because they have uh, shared their portfolio with you recently. So um, yeah, this is our growing team. And uh, a little bit about me. So I actually went to school for illustration at Art Center. And uh, this is some of my portfolio pieces. Uh, some of them were from school and some of them were uh, with my professional work. But I've dabbled in illustration, I've dabbled in graphic design, um, and, as, uh, and I've worked in advertising. And I have had the opportunity to look at hundreds of portfolios. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say hundreds. Um, if not thousands of portfolios, both student portfolios as well as professional portfolios. So um, I, you know, discovered my own personal journey, uh, you know, back when, uh, when I first went to art school, I went to school for fine art <laughs> and I had no idea what I was getting into. And for fine, as a fine artist, now I can kind of tell you if I had to choose again, I would have probably done my research um, because I didn't stay in fine art. I switched majors to illustration because I discovered that I really am just a storyteller. So I don't really, you know, um, I, I, I didn't enjoy fine art as much as I did illustration and this whole you know, journey of discovery is a lifelong endeavor that should be uh, an enjoyable experience, not a stressful one. And hopefully um, I can share some of some tips with you and some lifelong lessons uh, that will help you with your creative transformation. So again, this is some of my illustration work and uh, this is some of my design work. So halfway through illustration school, I uh, <laughs> fell in love with design. And uh, I happened to work with uh, an artist and designer named Milton Glaser. Some of you might have heard of him. He uh, is a very, very famous illustrator, graphic designer. He designed the I Love New York logo, uh, just to give you some context. So he made me fall in love with design, with typography, communication. And I really learned that I uh, really enjoyed uh, visual storytelling. So storytelling through typography, storytelling through imagery. And uh, so this is some of my design work. So I spent about seven years in graphic design and in advertising. And I had a blast <laughs> designing logos, um, you know, ads and all kinds of really cool projects with a lot of collaborators. Um, and then this is some of my recent work. So <laughs> funny enough, I recently went back into fine arts and uh, this was done at an artist retreat. So I was actually sponsored to, uh, to go to China with a group of international artists and we made art together uh, and it was exhibited uh, internationally. And some of these things are, uh, some of these pieces are huge and they are uh, in collections um, halfway across the globe. So that was really exciting. So, um, I, <laughs> I want to show you some of the work that I did when I was a child. Uh, so the piece on the left was my very first piece titled Traffic. And uh, I did it when I was five years old. 
And so I, you know, I would always just draw every day. And so my parents uh, recognized that I, you know, had a knack for art and uh, they put me in art school <laughs> um, and I got to learn with amazing people. Uh, and then the image on the right is also called Traffic. Um, and it is a piece that's about, you know, five feet or six, uh, three by six feet. Um, one of my largest, most ambitious portrait paintings. Uh, it's a depiction of Vietnam when I was actually uh, stuck in traffic and I kind of turned around and made eye contact with a whole bunch of people. So I, uh, in my painting, I tend to uh, illustrate images that stand out to me. So this is a, a series um, that is called Travel Memoirs. So, you know, my journey uh, as an artist, obviously, you know, you can, you can see that transformation. And I really, really hope that those of you who are watching, you know, even if you think my work is not good enough, you know, I don't think I will get in, uh, this is too hard, you know, all of those things um, will, you just have to keep going and just keep going, find supportive people, uh, who will help you along your journey and you will get there. So just keep dreaming big. Okay, so everybody is here to learn about the biggest portfolio mistakes. And I have 12 of them to share with you. And, uh, you know, when you're building a portfolio, there's always a chance that you miss something, right? And, you know, when I was building a portfolio, YouTube didn't exist. Nothing, um, nobody told me uh, about mistakes. I had like an actual physical portfolio that looked something like this. And it was very clunky. And, uh, and I, you know, I, I don't have it anymore. I don't actually have the physical pieces but we do have some amazing uh, teachers who have graciously shared their portfolio examples and uh, you can definitely look at them for inspiration and I'll talk about them in a second. So before we move on, uh, I do want to let you know that you are, you are definitely welcome to put any questions you have in the chat and I will make some time to answer everybody's questions because I want everyone to feel supported and that you are not alone in this. Um, all right, so I think one of the most common mistakes is not being sure about which program is right for you. So this is something that is very, very common that I see a lot of uh, young artists uh, make this mistake. You know, they come to me with their portfolio and I ask them, uh, you know, which programs are you applying for? And they still are unsure. They're not exactly sure, you know, what's involved in the program. They, they're, you know, they're unsure between illustration and graphic design or maybe architecture and interior design like they're not actually sure and you know applying to a program that you're not sure about is probably going to be the biggest mistake and that's the one of my biggest mistakes so when i went to art school again i thought i want to be a fine artist did i do my research no did i know what uh you know did I know what a fine artist even did? I think I had an idea, but when I went to my first fine art class, I knew that it was not right for me. And so I had to switch my major. So I went to Art Center. Uh, these are some of the well-known art schools in North America. Uh, if you're tuning in from uh, internationally, <laughs> Um, I'm sure there are a, a very, very large selection of amazing schools that you can apply for. Um, so personally, I went to Art Center, College of Design for Illustration, uh, and I really enjoyed it, but I stumbled into it without really knowing what I wanted to do. So don't apply for a program you're unsure about. So how, how do you actually, you know, how do you become sure of a program? how do you know which program is right for you or which school is right for you so a lot of people come to me for recommendations 
And I, you know, I always tell them the same thing, like whatever you decide is up to you. But some tips I have uh, to actually do your research is to go to the grad shows. Um, so almost every school out there, they usually have a graduation showcase. Uh, sometimes it's in person, these days it's online, but you have access to it. We have access to the internet at our fingertips. You are able to see, you know, countless portfolio examples. You're, you can actually go to these grad shows and visit the artists in person, ask them questions about their program. Uh, so this is an example of, a, uh, of an illustration, a grad show um, that I found uh, very appealing. Uh, this is a, uh, a wall from OCAD's drawing and painting. So I go to the grad show every year uh, because that's where I find the freshest talent. Um, so I find it's a great place for employers to hire uh, artists and it's also a great place to get to know your program to get to see all of the work that comes out of it because sometimes the work that you see in the grad shows may not be what you expect from the school itself so that's probably one of the best ways you can uh, figure it out so uh, this is actually when I went to visit uh, Jay Jay's grad show um, Jay is a graphic designer, so uh, he graduated from York Sheridan. Uh, if you look at some of our previous videos, you will actually see Jay's entrance portfolio. So here I visited Jay at his grad show, asked him lots of questions, and you know, I really thought that the graphic design program uh, at York Sheridan was great. There were so many, you know, original projects. Uh, I had a lot of fun. So, you know, don't apply to programs unless you are sure that that's what you want to do. And another, uh, another way you can really do your research is to go to forums. You know, you can do a lot of reading, ask questions, visit the campus, make sure that it's the right decision because it could be four years of your life, right? It is probably the biggest decision that you have to make. And if you're not sure, talk to a creative professional. Uh, talk and shadow, uh, shadow an illustrator, shadow a graphic designer. I've known many young artists who had to cold call. Actually, Jay told me a story. He said that he, uh, at, at part of his program, he had to actually cold call uh, a graphic designer and, and interview them. And uh, he ended up building great relationships. And, you know, now is the best time to be able to pick the brains of creative professionals because they are more available and willing to help than ever before. So that is my first tip. Okay, so our second tip is don't skim over the instructions. Read the requirements carefully. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I have seen people get disqualified for not following instructions. So this is, you're probably thinking this is so obvious, <laughs> you know, I know, uh, but sometimes people are applying for multiple programs. So, you know, some people, I've, I've, I've heard of, uh, one of my students was applying for seven different programs. And, and I told them, I was like, seven programs, that is a lot to keep track of, right? So personally, I wouldn't apply for seven. I would probably choose my top three. Uh, I know some people who just applied to one, so they're putting all their eggs in one basket. So I wouldn't do that either. I would definitely, uh, you know, choose my top three, put all of my energy towards my top choice and um, carefully, carefully read the instructions. So I find the best thing to do is to start a doc or create a spreadsheet where you can put all the requirements, you know, together so you can compare them, right? Make a table, do whatever it is you need to do to keep everything organized, right? So that you're comparing apples to apples, you're comparing one school's requirements to the other, you're comparing all of the sketchbook requirements, and that way you don't get overwhelmed. Um, so one of the stories uh, I, I have for you as uh, an adjudicator. So one time I was an adjudicator for a visual arts high school. And I noticed that a lot of the people who submitted their work, and this was in person. 
So, you know, I was at the school and a lot of people used the school's easels to display their work. And in the written requirements, uh, the written document to the applicants said, bring your own easels, do not use the school's easels. But everybody used the school's easels. So I think what happened was, you know, one person said, oh, here's a free easel, I'm just gonna use it. And then everybody else just kind of followed suit. So just because one person is doing something doesn't mean that it's the right thing. So read those instructions very, very carefully and pay attention to the details because those borrowed easels uh, really, you know, pissed off some teachers because now they don't have easels to do their class. So, you know, it can be the smallest thing that can really make a big difference. So if I'm looking at your work and I'm already upset, you know, or pissed off that you are not following the, inst the instructions and you are not, you know, using your own equipment, that is already a negative first impression. So it doesn't matter how good your book is, that has already made a negative impression on me. And I'm probably, you know, not going to, uh, or, or any adjudicator who goes in with that feeling will probably, you know, not uh, give you the best grade <laughs> that you deserve. So make sure that you read the requirements carefully because some schools ask for descriptions, other schools only ask for the medium and the size. So make sure that you're not just creating one portfolio and sending it to everybody. Okay, also if you're not sure about something, don't be afraid to inquire. Uh, don't just follow the herd because the herd can, can lead you in the wrong direction and I've seen that happen way too many times. All right, so my third tip for you is don't start your portfolio with a weak piece, okay? <laughs> so make a, a really strong first impression. People typically remember the first thing they see and the last thing they see. So I would advise anybody preparing a portfolio to put in your strongest piece first. By strongest, I mean most uh, technically impressive and most conceptually impressive. So put your best piece first and put your second best piece last, okay? Be a boss, not weak sauce. I love this quote. Um, and the bang is there because it's, uh, I like to say, start with a bang and end with a bang, okay? That's how you make a strong first impression and a strong last impression. It's just a psychology, right? We, 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 we always remember the first thing and the last thing that we see, typically speaking, and uh, do not, absolutely do not put fan art first. I will get to fan art in just a second. Uh, but do not put fan art first because usually schools don't like that and they will write you off immediately, okay? So put your best piece first. Okay, so my next tip is don't show too many pieces that use the same medium, subject, or style unless it's explicitly required. So some animation portfolios will, uh, you know, will request only line drawings and that's absolutely okay because, you know, that's what is required. So if you have very specific requirements like a drawing test uh, or an essay or something like that, that is very uh, specific, then this does not apply. But usually speaking, when you show too many pieces that are similar, it actually limits your uh, your variety. So variety is something that is really, really important in school portfolios because it, uh, it allows the adjudicators to see that you are exploring different types of styles, different types of mediums. They, they, they can sense your sense of adventure. They can see your versatility, you know, especially if you're applying for design or fashion. Uh, you know, you don't want 
to include, if, if you're applying for fashion, you don't want to include all dresses, right? You want to show that you can design for men, you can design for women, that you can, you know, uh, design for children, you know, that you're thinking about all different types of applications. So if you are, uh, if you have questions in the chat, just please know I will get to them. Uh, there is a slight delay. Um, Amaris Joseph says, can you do a video about fashion portfolios or any portfolio setup? For sure. So fashion is, um, so all of the portfolio vi uh, videos that you see can be applied to, to almost any type of art school because the principles are all the same, right? So what I'm sharing with you today can be applied for any type of portfolio. Uh, any type of, you know, whether it's photography or fashion or interior design, all of the principles are the same, right? Your work should be conceptual. It should have variety. It should showcase your process. Uh, I will get to all of those in, in a second, but just because you don't see specific uh, examples, it doesn't mean that you can't apply these uh, tips to any type of creative portfolio. Okay, so versatility and variety is really, really important because I can't tell you how many portfolios I've seen that are just pencil. Like, can I say boring, <laughs> right? Um, I've seen sketchbooks that are just pencil and I've seen, you know, um, lots of, I, I'll, I'll tell you the most common pieces that I see that are really boring, okay? Uh, all pencil portfolios or, uh, portfolios that are very heavily heavy one subject for example lots of portraiture um you know realistic portraiture uh that are all bored looking faces you know uh that are done with just one medium so i want to see if you have realistic pieces i want to see some abstract stuff you know if you do really amazing tight drawings i want to see some loose stuff if you are a loose artist and you like to, you know, um, uh, be experimental and, you know, you, uh, let's say, let's say you're, you're working with drips, right? Let's say you're using lots of texture. Um, I want to see super, super clean work, like rendered work. So from, from variety can be a uh, variety in style. It can be variety in subject matter, variety in thinking and exploring ideas. So variety is really, really important in a school portfolio, not as important in a professional portfolio because that is that can be more style driven, right? When you come out of school, you already have uh, a, a style or something that you're, you're known for, um, you know, for illustration or for fashion, for example, uh, you can specialize when you're out of school, but when you're going into school, you know, you want to show as much variety as possible. Okay, so I'm going to share with you a quote. If you do the bare minimum, expect bare minimum results, right? If you want to be great, work to be great. Nothing just happens. So this is a quote by J.J. Watt. Uh, and this brings me to my next tip for you. And that's don't do the bare minimum. So what I mean by bare minimum is if your school requires 10 to 20 pieces, you know, doing 10 would count as the bare minimum. So, you know, you don't necessarily want to show too many, but you also don't want to show that the bare minimum, because when I see uh, that you've only submitted 10 pieces, I'm either going to assume that you're a very good editor and you're being very, very selective, or you just don't have enough work. And usually it's the second, right? If you have 10 pieces and they're all outstanding and solid, then, you know, maybe that's okay. But typically speaking, you don't want to do the bare minimum. So if, you're, if your school, you know, says tw uh, 10 to 20 pieces, showing 15 is better than showing 10. Showing 12 is better than showing 10. Just give a little extra, right? So that it doesn't appear like you're doing the bare minimum. All right, so let's talk about fan art. <laughs> so 
don't include obvious fan art. So, you know, there fan art is is difficult to to dis, to talk about because there can be so many different types of fan art, right? The fan art that schools don't want to see is the obvious fan art. Like I can I can see that oh, oh, it's Deadpool. You know, I can recognize these characters uh, from popular movies, TV shows, games. I see them over and over again. You know, fan art is so common and, you know, there's nothing wrong with fan art. First of all, I want to put this out there. There's nothing wrong with fan art uh, outside of a portfolio. Fan art is, uh, a lot of the times, it's why we start making art, right? We draw our favorite characters. It's it's the beginning of our journey. Um, I know that when I was a teen, I drew lots of Sailor Moon because I loved anime and everybody loves anime these days, but school portfolios do not. And some of them explicitly say, do not include fan art. Okay, so if you have a lot of fan art and you're kind of freaking out a little bit inside and you're saying, oh my gosh, what? do I include? Is there good fan art? Uh, and the answer is yes, there is good fan art, but you have to be very, very careful because the obvious fan art is, oh, I can, I can recognize who that is. So that is the biggest no-no. <laughs> One of the biggest mistakes in portfolios is I see people recreating a Disney character or a Marvel character or like redrawing them in their style, but still I can recognize them. So I'm going to show you uh, some examples of non-obvious fan art. This is actually uh, Jesse's work. So Jesse uh, created these illustrations. You can see the videos on our channel. So Jesse was, uh, maybe still is, uh, obsessed with Animal Crossing. And she loved Animal Crossing uh, so much that she did a lot of fan art uh, inspired by these characters. And she actually turned the characters into Zizinkas. So a Zizinka is a, uh, is a human version of a non-human character. Uh, and you can see, yes, you know, if you play Animal Crossing, you can probably recognize the inspiration, right? But it's not instantly recognizable. And she's changed up the characters a lot so that they're interesting, they have a personality, they're all interacting, right? So the example, you know, on the um, on the left, you can see the characters are all kind of reacting to each other. Um, you know, there's, there's emotion, there's storytelling, and uh, on the right uh, as well, an assortment of odd uh, characters, you know, inspired by the video game but it has a lot of creativity and a lot of personal flair that to me is okay. So if I'm an adjudicator and I see this, I would probably think it's okay, right? But if I see, you know, stuff that's instantly, oops, instantly recognizable, then uh, I would say not a good thing. Okay. So let me know if you have any questions about fan art. Uh, we can do an entire stream about fan art. Um, but my next tip is less is more. Uh, also, don't show too much. So like, like that other tip, don't do the bare minimum. Well, also don't show too much. Um, there's a famous design principle called less is more and uh, the reason why you don't want to show too much is you only appear as strong as your weakest piece. So it's very unfortunate sometimes, you know, we don't always have the best judgment when it comes to our own portfolios. Sometimes there's a piece in there that we really like, that we personally really, really like, right? So if I'm a huge Animal Crossing fan and I really want to put in my fan art uh, because it, it means a lot to me, right? But it's fan art or it doesn't really uh, showcase my creativity uh, or maybe it's just like not as technically strong or as conceptually strong. So if you have one piece that is kind of weak, right? It's It starts to stand out next to your strong pieces. So this is a hard one. You have to learn how to be a ruthless editor. 
you know, you have to be able to be very objective about looking at your artwork. And that's very, very hard to do because we are the creators, right? When you create something, it's, it's, it's like your baby. It's your, you are personally invested in it, right? So uh, one of the best ways you can get away from this is to get a professional opinion. So, you know, usually professional creatives will be able to tell you which piece is your weakest piece. And sometimes you'll have no idea, right? So always uh, consult a creative professional, a teacher, a mentor, uh, somebody that you, you can trust. Um, there are also lots of uh, public forums. And we, for example, um, I will be doing a portfolio critique as well, a live critique on Saturday. So if you want my opinion on, you know, here are all the pieces I submit. Do you see any, any, any pieces that I should cut? I'll tell you. Uh, I'll be able to uh, give you an objective opinion about it. Um, and sometimes, you know, maybe that weak piece can be improved. So it's not always you have to cut it. Maybe there's something that st uh, stands out. A lot of the times it's human proportions. So a lot of the times it's, you know, the head is too big or there's something that is uh, technically wrong that's standing out. Um, and those things can be very easily fixed, right? So um, uh, the other thing is that some technically impressive pieces can be kind of weak with an idea like there's no idea it's just kind of a study or it's you know just an observational drawing there's nothing really special about it um, and there are some pieces that have great ideas but they can be executed better right so a, a portfolio is a good balance of technical work like really good uh, technical skills as well as creativity and ideas so don't show too much be a ruthless editor and remember you only appear as strong as your weakest piece okay so um i mentioned jesse's work uh already some of you have been following her live streams on fridays uh, Jesse teaches digital art and illustration and mentorship at wing canvas this is directly from her, her illustration portfolio. Um, she had a lot of digital pieces. I think she had some traditional, yeah, she had some traditional life drawings uh, and she had one traditional piece uh, in her portfolio. And I was talking to Jesse about it and she's like, oh, I should have put more traditional work. I didn't ask anybody. I didn't show anybody my portfolio. Um, she can tell you the story. You can check out her portfolio example video and learn all about her mistakes because we all go through, uh, you know, the same journey and the same stress um, when we are applying. Uh, you know, everybody is going through it. So you are not alone in this. Um, Jessie's work is amazing. Like she has uh, the, you know, the, the piece on the top left is actually a piece from that she drew out of her head that she dreamt up like she she has these these creepy dreams and you know um very conceptual pieces so the one in the, on the top middle you know is is really kind of about uh our 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 culture and like the decay of culture like i really see um some really really strong ideas in her piece she's also a comic artist and she has a webtoon called say hello grayson uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful series. I highly suggest you check it out. Uh, so she has a lot of comic work. So, you know, she's a natural storyteller, comic artist, um, and concept artist because she went to game design for a couple of years. So her portfolio was very heavily digital. And as much as, um, you know, I believe digital art is real art, definitely is real art. It's very much, uh, it takes just the same amount of technique and effort. Um, however, art schools don't like to see that you're doing all digital pieces because there are some digital shortcuts, right, that a lot of people rely on. Things like, you know, you don't have to mix paint. You can just kind of choose your color, right? So things, things like that. And you know, it also comes down to variety, right? 
variety in medium. So you don't want to do all digital pieces and you don't want to show only traditional pieces either, right? You want to show that you're exploring different mediums. So if you're applying for fine arts or illustration, you know, show that you can paint in, in gouache and watercolor in acrylic or, you know, show, show that you are experimenting with collage or with sculpture and digital, right? So the more variety of mediums you can put in your work, the stronger it will be. Okay, so just because your work is, uh, it is exceptional like Jessie's, right? Um, she'll tell you the story. She got waitlisted and it was absolutely heartbreaking. Heartbreaking for all of us, right? Um, luckily, Jess, Jessie uh, uh, is now in illustration at OCAD. Um, but, you know, one of the things that, that she uh, regretted was not putting enough traditional work in her portfolio. Okay, and you can check out Jessie's examples and her actual story uh, in our past uh, videos in our portfolio playlist. Okay, so one of the most common mistakes that I see are stating the obvious in your descriptions. Okay, don't state the obvious in your descriptions. You're going to make the adjudicator feel dumb, okay? Like, no joke, I have seen <laughs> descriptions that are like, this is a still life that my teacher told me to do. It's just like, really? Like, you can't come up with a better description than that. So, you know, don't state the obvious. If you're showing me a still life of an apple, right? If you're showing me a still life of an apple. Don't tell me that it's a still life of an apple. I can see that. Tell me why you chose to draw an apple. Tell me what the apple symbolizes. Uh, you know, tell me how you chose to light it. Tell me who your inspirations were. Like, you know, uh, um, for example, uh, were you inspired by Caravaggio's lighting, his very super dramatic lighting? You know, does the apple symbolize life? Does it symbolize, you know, um, a, a, some kind of story? Give me a good explanation. Don't tell me what I can already see. Because not only is it, like, duh, I can see that. It doesn't really help your piece, right? Um, so tell me why. Uh, tell me why you did it this way. Um, show me something else. And then uh, another tip that I have um, for those of you writing descriptions is if you can't write a good description, the, the artwork is probably not that interesting, right? If, if the artwork that you make is highly conceptual and interesting, you'll naturally be able to tell me a story. And make sure that the, that, that the description isn't a paragraph either. Like, I don't have time to read a novel about why you, you know, made this still life. Tell me in a tweet. Try to tell me in a short, succinct way and try to tell me why you did something, right? Instead of what it is. So um, this is, this is a, a, a very common mistake uh, that I see um, with your descriptions. A lot of people say, what should I put in my descriptions? Um, I would say, tell me what I am not able to see. Give me a clue. Show me your personality. Those are the things you want to put in your descriptions. Don't, don't state the obvious. Okay. So... Let's talk a little bit about sketchbooks uh, because sketchbooks are required in a lot of programs, a lot of visual arts programs. And the reason why people want to see your sketchbook is for your process work. So never underestimate the importance of process work. And, you know, you may be thinking, oh my gosh, I don't have any process work. I like, what is process work anyway? So just like, uh, just like in math class, right? If you, if you think back to math class, your math teacher won't just accept an answer. They actually want to see your process work. They want to see how you arrived at the answer. They want to see all of the steps, all of the thinking and the logic behind it, right? 
So I'm not saying sketchbooks necessarily need to be logical because a lot of the times they are just a collection of notes. Uh, they are, you know, scribbles and, you know, stream of consciousness, doodles and things like that. And that's perfectly fine. But don't underestimate the process, uh, the, the importance of process work. Because if I can see the way you think, then I am more likely to believe that you are a, a like you are capable of making very original pieces, right? You're not just somebody who can copy something realistically. So just because you have very good technical skills and you can copy things is not enough. You need to show me that you have original ideas, that you take the time to think about what you're going to create. These things are all really, really important in a sketchbook. So a sketchbook is not uh, supposed to be a collection of perfect drawings. So I think I think back to when I submitted my my portfolio, uh, my portfolio, my sketchbook was like perfect drawings on every single page, and you know some notes here and there. Um, but your sketchbook really shouldn't be a perfect collection of drawings, right? Those are your actual pieces. Your sketchbook should be messy. It should be raw. Um, so this example here is actually Jay's example that he shared recently. And you can see here that he's got his uh, notes in uh, his sketchbook. So this piece was actually about social media. And you'll see that the, um, you know, the anglerfish on the right so this the the final piece is actually uh, over here on the right so the anglerfish represents social media so think about facebook or instagram just kind of luring people in and then the general public uh, is represented by the goldfish and so you can see he he did studies of the goldfish so he actually drew goldfish in you know different positions he really studied the movement of them uh, he wrote down his, his, the, you know, the meaning behind his work. Um, and you'll also see that he's put tabs in his sketchbook because sometimes, you know, when you submit a sketchbook, you can submit a, uh, like a video. So a video flip through, uh, or if you hand it into an adjudicator, you can actually tab it so that they can look at your selects, right? So you can, if, if you don't want them to miss your sketchbook, because a lot of the time they'll just pick it up, flip through it, you know, less than 20 seconds and then they're done. So tabbing your sketchbook will really give them some visual cues and they'll make sure, like whenever I see tabs, I'm like, oh, okay, this person wants me to actually uh, look at uh, specific pages. So I'm going to, you know, make the time to do that. Okay. So one more example, uh, this is a sketchbook page from Alina. So Alina uh, is one of our teachers, just like Jay teaches graphic design. Alina teaches uh, comics and manga, uh, and she is currently at Sheridan Animation. And this was one of the sketchbook pages that was in her portfolio. So you can see she does a lot of life drawing. She does a lot of stylization. Uh, and then the figures on the right are, you know, exaggerated uh, figures. So she's trying different things. She's trying, you know, to exaggerate the shapes. Um, she's trying more geometric figures versus more curvy figures. You know, this is all a an exploration. So these are just ideas and beginnings of things. And you can see the way she uses color, right? You know, it can be very, very simple, but pops of color in your sketchbook is really, really eye-catching. And it's a lot more interesting than pencil. So in your sketchbook, you know, you can use watercolor, you can use marker, you can use pen. Uh, please don't just limit yourself to pencil. Okay, so next tip. <laughs> so I don't know if you can guess this uh, tip by just the images here, but one of the biggest mistakes I see are low quality images. So this is totally preventable, uh, low quality images. You know, we all have built in uh, amazing cameras on our phones these days, right? So phone cameras are, um, 
you know, the camera on your phone is perfectly fine. You don't need to take your work out to get professionally photographed unless it's a specific case. Um, you know, with a, maybe it's a painting that has a lot of glare, like then it's okay to get professional imaging. But uh, these images are some very common mistakes. So the one on the left uh, is one of my figure drawings and you can see that there's a shadow of a person right right in front of it and so this is actually um, when you are getting in your own way of taking the photo um, you can kind of see that uh, that's a big no-no right it just shows that you're not able to take a good quality image uh, the one in the middle is an abstract painting, but you can see that it's blurry, right? It's pixelated. It's not a good quality image. And this is really, really bad for your portfolio, especially if you're a graphic designer. And it's even worse because like, you know, pixelated images is like a big no-no in the design industry. Uh, make sure that you take good quality images, okay? So one of the ways that I like to take quality images is just using natural light so if you can put your artwork by a window uh, you know use natural daylight make sure that your camera is level and uh, make sure when you take the picture that you can also edit it right so most photo editors i mean i just use google photos to, to edit photos now but most photo editors will allow you to tilt and distort um, and adjust the contrast, ad adjust the brightness. So a lot of the times I'll have my image right next to me, my original next to me, and then the photograph that I take. And I make sure that uh, I try to get it as close to the original as possible and make sure that my images are crisp. So sometimes you may be limited in the file size of your image. So if that's the case, there are lots of great resizer tools out there that are free. Um, and you can easily resize your images without losing resolution. So typically, if you scale your images to about, you know, 1080 by 1080 pixels, that's, that's like the Instagram size. Um, that's usually okay for a digital portfolio. Uh, keep in mind that a high resolution screen is about 1920 by 1080 pixels, right? So it doesn't have to be a huge file. It just needs to be crisp and formatted properly. So I included Patrick the Starfish there because the only time you should include pixelated images is if you're doing pixel art. Um, <laughs> so that, that was a reminder for me to actually, uh, go through that, uh, and make sure that I don't miss that point. Okay. So we are, ah, we are at our last tip. And then I have some other, uh, tips to share with you. So, uh, tip number 12 is don't be afraid to have an opinion. So does this mean you have to be offensive? Does this mean you have to be, you know, loud or obnoxious? No, it just means that you should be yourself. You shouldn't be afraid to advocate for things that you care about. Um, art, a lot of times, you know, we create art for advocacy. I create art all the time inspired by issues that I care about. You know, whether it's human rights or racism or saving the environment or animal welfare, these are all things that I personally really care about. So a lot of the themes within my artwork, um, you know, echo some of the some of the some of the causes that I really care about. So this is a way to have an opinion. Right. What do you stand for? Can you show that in your artwork? Right. If all of your artwork is very neutral, you know, that's okay. It just isn't, it doesn't, it's not as memorable. It doesn't stand out as much. It doesn't show your personality. So, you know, maybe you're really funny, right? Maybe you are, uh, you tell great jokes. Uh, maybe you are, you know, super into, you know, one, one, one cause or, uh, you know, a, a theme that, that you really, really care about. Um, or maybe you, uh, 
you know, you create some pieces that really move people. So if you can move me, if you can make me laugh, uh, if you can really, you know, make an emotional impact on me, that is what is truly memorable. So both of these pieces uh, that I showed you here, uh, both of them are my own pieces. They are some of my demos from my classes. So um, it's just an example of what, uh, you know, what I do personally to, to advocate for the causes that I care about. Um, and so um, this is George Floyd. So this, this piece uh, I actually did in my painting mentorship. It's a, it's a digital piece. There's some digital collage in here. Uh, and I'm showing you my process work. Um, so pretend the stuff on the right is in my sketchbook. If you do your process work digitally, you know, you can cut it out and you can put it in your sketchbook. There's nothing wrong with cutting and pasting things into your sketchbook. Uh, actually, I think that that's kind of nice to have different textures. So definitely uh, do that. And this piece, uh, you know, hopefully the idea is a bit more clear in it um, and I don't have to explain it so much, but it, again, it's about human consumption um, and sort of our unawareness that uh, the things that we're doing are really destroying the beauty and nature around us. So this is a, also a, a, an issue that I'm passionate about. And, um, you know, you can see some of my process work and my thinking in here. Okay, so those are my top 12 tips for what not to do in a portfolio. These are the most common mistakes that I see. Okay, so um, you've seen some of my work. Uh, I actually teach figure drawing and I am a mentor. And uh, I, one of my, you know, I've from working in illustration to graphic design to advertising, uh, in advertising, I got to work with a lot of amazing people. So I worked with, you know, uh, stylists, uh, shooting commercials, film directors, video editors. And that's what I really, really love about my job as an, uh, as an art director. And that's sort of what I still do today. And, um, you know, I work with an amazing team. And one of the best things about what I do is to be able to help uh, you know, aspiring artists, just like I was uh, at one point, uh, to get into the school of your dreams. So I teach figure drawing, that's what I specialize in, and I actually teach a figure drawing intensive. So figure drawing is one of those things that is required in uh, animation portfolios as well as illustration portfolios and if you're a fine artist figure drawing is really really good if you're a fashion you know if you're studying fashion uh, definitely you would you know need, need figure drawing skills so figure drawing is kind of like the foundation of uh, realism and you know realistic drawing if you can draw figures you can draw anything. So I studied figure drawing for, oh my gosh, more than half of my life, uh, a big, a big chunk of my life. And I love teaching figure drawing. So I'm actually teaching an art intensive over the winter. So it actually starts next week. And the last day to register is Saturday. So if you want to work with me uh, to learn figure drawing, uh, definitely check that out. Uh, I think Daria will be dropping some links in the chat and you can also find some links to these programs in the description below. So I do want to show you the uh, some of the amazing work and the programs that we have and a lot of the other uh, portfolio resources that we've made this week. So uh, there are portfolio examples that I mentioned before and lots of really valuable advice from our mentors, from our, um, our amazing team of teachers and professional artists who love uh, mentoring young artists and you know, aspiring designers. So uh, the first artist you may have seen is Alina. So, Alina, uh, in this video here, she shares her 
uh, her animation portfolio, her winning animation portfolio for Sheridan Animation. So I know animation is a very, very popular uh, program choice. So if you want to see some examples and you want to see how Alina got in, she actually shares her score sheet with you as well um, and some really, really sound advice. So definitely check out her video. And if you want to work with Alina, uh, Alina will be teaching comics and manga. So uh, if you are studying illustration and you know you really want to get better at storytelling, storyboarding, composition, you know narrative illustration, uh, definitely check out her comics and manga intensive. So when I say intensive, that is really, it's really a boot camp for making amazing portfolio pieces. So if you work with me, you know, you'll, you'll get a lot of figure drawings. If you work with Alina, uh, you will get a lot of comics. And um, so uh, in, in Alina's video, actually, she, she also shows her sketchbook, which, which is really, really uh, amazing. And you can definitely pick her brain. So if you are, uh, hoping to go to animation school, definitely, uh, you know, <laughs> check out Alina's art intensive. Okay. So the other artist you may have seen is Jesse. So Jesse is the main, uh, content creator on our channel and she has a great story. So Jesse actually started off in game design, had the same revelation that I did. Oh, it's not it's not what I expected. It's not what I want to do. And she realized that she was actually more of an illustrator. So she actually realized this by creating her comic. And when she made her comic, you know, she really, she was really, uh, really into it and really discovered that her passion relied on, on, on storytelling. And uh, so she decided to switch to OCAD illustration. She got into the program and uh, you can listen to her story and check out her actual portfolio pieces. So Jessie teaches illustration. Um, she will be teaching our art intensive in illustration and that starts uh, in December. So that starts after Christmas. Um, so don't miss out on creating some amazing illustrations. So Jessie is a digital artist. She'll be teaching digitally. So if you want to really work on your digital skills, uh, definitely work with Jessie and you will learn so much from her. She's so much fun. And uh, there are only 12 spots in each of these intensive programs. There's only 12 spots. So you have to make sure that you register in time because they will fill up and uh, you don't want to miss the chance to work with Jessie or Alina. <laughs> um, all right, and Jay. So Jay is an award-winning graphic designer and Jay is also a mentor and he, he has mentored all of our design students and staff and co-ops uh, and volunteers. Uh, he designs our website and uh, Jay has so much knowledge uh, just, you know, from, from, um, you know, branding to design. Jay is also an illustrator. If you look at some of his, his examples, he also does digital illustration. So he is an all round, uh, wonderful communicator and he can, you can learn so much about graphic design from Jay. So if you are considering graphic design or wondering, you know, what is graphic design? What does a graphic designer do? Uh, take Jay's Art Intensive and you will not only get pieces for your portfolio, but you will also learn, you know, what a graphic designer does. You can pick his brain and learn about the, the, the program before you apply and commit to be a graphic designer. So I love graphic design as well. I think it's, it's a really, really, really cool profession. Um, lots of fun work that you can uh, create when you are a graphic designer. Okay. So I want to leave you with some inspiration and some motivation because I'm sure a lot of you are, uh, you know, are a little bit stressed and, and panicked because portfolio season is coming up. Um, and 
you know, if you feel like you're not there yet, or you feel like, you know, uh, you, you still need some, um, some technique building, you know, that's okay. Uh, the greats weren't great because at birth they could paint, you know, they were great because they paint a lot. So you can switch the word paint with anything, right? Draw or design. Um, but in short, you know, you just have to do it. The more you practice, the better you will be. So for all the portfolio students out there, if you are not drawing every single day, you are missing, you're, you're, you're selling yourself short. If you are only drawing, you know, if you're, if you're drawing for eight hours once a week, it's not as effective as drawing for one hour every single day. Make the time to be great, okay? Don't spend the time on Instagram looking at how great everybody else is because that is not constructive to your own growth. You want to be motivated? Turn the social media off, focus on your work, put on some great music, and draw every single day. If you need an accountability partner, find a mentor. You know, I can work with you, you know, Jay or Lena or Jesse. We can all help you, help you stay motivated and on track, but don't stall. And the worst thing you can do is compare yourself to other people, okay? So get off Instagram, get off TikTok, get off social media. We waste hours every single day on social media. Just channel that time into working on your own creative development and you will be great. Okay, so there are some times where you don't get into the art school that you want or you may not get into your top choice. So if that happens, you know, don't worry about it life is a big lesson it's a big adventure so sometimes things happen for a reason right sometimes you know you might feel crushed but it could be a blessing in disguise so you only fail when you stop trying so just because you don't get into the school of your dreams if you stop trying and you're like oh okay well that's it that's it for me i'm not going to be creative anymore then you are again you're selling yourself short right you only fail when you stop trying. So do not stop trying. Only let that failure, it's not actually a failure, right? I call it a roadblock. Let that roadblock light that fire under your butt to keep you drawing and keep you motivated. Only channel that into motivation, motivational energy. Do not let that stop you because the worst thing a creative person can do is to extinguish that fire inside them that tells you that you have to create, that if you don't create, you know, you'll be miserable, right? Don't allow that to happen. So, you know, what happens? What, what happens if you don't get into the school of your dreams? A lot of my students end up taking a gap year. And a gap year could be a wonderful experience. You, you can, you know, depending on what you do with it, right? If you take that gap year and you make a commitment to draw every single day, whether it's drawing along to YouTubers, you know, whether it's taking some programs, whether it's finding a mentor and really focusing on creating amazing work to then get into the school of your dreams, don't settle for anything less and, you know, don't, give up. So the picture on the left is actually one of uh, our uh, of, of our wing canvas mottos um, and that is uh, no egos. <laughs> so at wing canvas we're big art nerds and one of our mottos is no egos. Why? Because your ego is what really stops you from um, you know, from creating because you're afraid of what other people might think, or, you know, you, 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 you feel like you're a failure and you don't want to be seen as a failure. No, no, no. Lose the ego. You will win. The ego is the worst thing that you have to battle. Everybody has one, right? But the key is to recognize it and don't let that stop you. Okay, so quit procrastinating all you procrastinators out there, if you're watching this and you're not drawing, go work on your art. Uh, 
remember drawing a little bit every single day goes a lot longer than kind of drawing for eight hours uh, in a day okay so um, just to just to introduce some of our winter portfolio programs we have just opened up a registration so you can you can uh, get yourself signed up for one of our portfolio camps so portfolio camp is like a boot camp okay so if you need somebody to light that fire under your butt if you need somebody to motivate you to tell you exactly what you need to do to your portfolio to pinpoint those weak areas right to help you like i help my students you know order their pieces like put this one first put this one last put these in the middle you know this figure drawing is weak put this one in or you can fix you can tweak this right this one has potential i can't tell you how many times i've seen uh people you know uh <laughs> like put work that they, they're like, oh, I really don't like this piece or I hate this piece. And I'm like, what are you talking about? This piece is amazing, you know, include it. Like definitely put it in. You, you just need to, you know, tweak it here and there. So there are some pieces that you may not even like that a, a mentor can really, you know, help you identify and tell you, yeah, keep going. It's really, really good. Um, Hey, Gabriel, shout out to you. Thank you for joining our stream. Um, those of you who, uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to put them in the chat and, uh, or, or if you're watching this uh, after we've gone live, you can uh, put any questions in the comments. I will be sure to answer them in our next stream. So even if you're not a portfolio student, I hope that this was really, really helpful. Um, I, I do want to mention that uh, our portfolio camp only has six spots. So there are only six spots uh, because we work one-on-one -on -one with each student. Uh, so the portfolio camp I am teaching as well as Jay. And, you know, both of us have backgrounds in multi multidisciplinary arts. So it doesn't matter what program you're going into. We can definitely help you. And there's only six spots because we have... Uh, we try to make time, uh, enough time to give each person one-on-one -on -one feedback and uh, very, very, uh, you know, constructive, specific, uh, constructive criticism and very, very specific tips for you to improve your work. Um, if you are, you know, if your portfolio is far from being done and you're kind of panicking right now, uh, we do have art intensives. So art intensives are uh, very program focused. So for example, if you really want to get better at figure drawing, you know, you can, you can take an art intensive with me. It's about four days and you'll get a, a lot of portfolio pieces out of it, as well as comics and manga, uh, illustration, graphic design. And, uh, you know, you will be working with a creative professional. So take this opportunity to pick their brain and uh, make sure that you get everything that you that you need uh, for your portfolio. So definitely share your portfolio requirements uh, with your mentors. So the way the program works is it's all online. It's all live and you can, uh, you know, the, these programs are uh, three hours a day for art intensives, an hour and a half a day for portfolio. And there's only 12 spots for each intensive. So don't wait. Uh, if you want to grab one of these spots, make sure you register before this Saturday. And so uh, just to reiterate our portfolio boot camp, uh, you will get art mentorship from Jay and myself. Uh, I think Jay is teaching the first week. I am teaching the last week. Our programs start next week. So if you are working on a portfolio specifically, I really recommend uh, this camp. It's nice and short and you will get very, very actionable feedback on your work and there's only six spots. So uh, don't wait uh, to sign up for these programs because they will go. Our art intensive schedule. Um, so we, December 20, 20th to 23rd, we, are, we have comics and manga and we have figure drawing. These are three hour programs. So they begin 11 a.m. to 12.30. 
uh, Eastern Standard Time with a one hour lunch break. And so they are, again, they are intensive. So you will be learning very, very specific uh, skills and it's perfect because it's crunch time and you need that motivation right now. You need more portfolio pieces, join these programs. Um, graphic design is a really special program. It's a new one that we are uh, doing this year. We only run it in the summer and in the winter time. You will learn about topography. Uh, you will learn how to create uh, posters. We have some exciting projects like emojis uh, that you'll be able to you know, design. You'll be able to uh, explore logos and the, uh, um, the principles of design. Definitely a really, really interesting program. If you're not sure about graphic design or you're interested, check it out. Um, and lastly, we have a Discord. So uh, if you are, uh, if you want to connect with us and you want uh, to share your artwork with our community, we have a growing community on Discord and the invite link is in the description. And I'm sure Daria will be uh, posting it in the chat uh, shortly. Um, and yeah, join our Discord community. We have a, uh, a channel dedicated to portfolio students. So you can share your artwork, you can motivate uh, each other, help each other, because we're all in this together. You know, you are not alone. <laughs> uh, so definitely connect with us and... Uh, you can also, I mentioned this before, you can submit your portfolio for a free live critique. So this Saturday at noon, I will be doing another stream. I'll be doing a Q&A and we've just got so many questions about portfolios from the community through our survey that we sent out. Um, so I will be answering those questions as well as giving some live critiques. So don't be shy. I know a lot of us are really shy about showing our work, but let me tell you a secret. As a professional artist, that's all you're going to be doing. You're going to be showing your artwork and people will be judging it. Like, you know, get used to it. That is the nature of being a creative professional. You got to put your work out there and you have to be okay with people having an opinion, right? Not everything, not everybody's going to like everything and that's okay. So, you know, getting a live critique is one of the best things that you can do, especially if you can get it from a, a creative professional, because then, you know, you'll be able to uh, get a much better perspective on your work. And even, you know, even if you're not sure, or even if your pieces are still works in progress, they're not fully developed yet, or, you know, maybe there's something you're not sure about, uh, that's okay, right? Include it, tell me it's a work in progress, you know, I might be able, like, I might see it and say, this is amazing. You should definitely, you know, move forward in this direction. So getting an opinion like that can really, really save you lots of time and energy and stress. So there is a link in the description. Go there, submit your portfolio for a live critique and do it as soon as you can, because I will be uh, selecting a few pieces to critique on Saturday. All right, everybody, that is it. Thank you so much for joining our stream today. I hope that uh, you learned a lot and I hope that it was very, very useful. Um, thank you for, to everybody who joined and uh, I look forward to seeing you on Saturday. And don't forget that there are very limited spots to our camps, so go ahead and register. The links will be in the description and pinned in the comments. All right, everybody, have a great night, and I will see you soon. Bye.